Hi, my name is Howard Liu, and I'm a child psychiatrist and chair of psychiatry at University of Nebraska Medical Center. I'm a proud member of the APA and a member of the APA Council on Communications on the social media group. And I'm thrilled that uh, Dr. Christina Gerges is with me. And uh, Christina, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, thanks. Hi, I'm Christina Gerges. I'm a psychiatrist uh, at Edward Hines Jr. VA Hospital. I'm the acting chief of staff of education um, and uh, designated education official. And uh, I am a consult liaison psychiatrist there for the past 13 years. That's great. <clears throat> and and, and just, a member of the Communications Council and APA, of course. Well, and truly a Facebook expert as well. We're thrilled to have your expertise Thank here. You. I would just say, uh, if it's okay for this conversation, uh, we'll go by first names for both of us yes, and, yes. and kind of make that a little bit easier. But uh, today we're gathered to talk a little bit about uh, social media and how do you navigate it uh, for kids, uh, both as a clinician, maybe advising others, but also even in our own families and thinking about that piece, which is complex and always ever changing. It seems like the guidelines are evolving. And I might just ask you, uh, Christina, if you're comfortable, uh, at what age do you think that we should allow our kids to be on social media? I know I, this is such a big loaded topic for and, and affects everybody since, um, you know, I think the last statistics I saw were 90% of, of kids are on social media at any given time. So all our kids are on social media. Um, so, you know, I think what the guidelines say is probably different one than what may actually be happening, but, um, you know, around age 10 is probably when kids are getting their first phones, right? And then anywhere from age 10 to 12 is when kids are actually getting onto social media and having their own accounts, right? I think Facebook allows for people to have their own accounts if they're 13 or older, but, um, you know, anybody can really get onto Facebook and create an account with uh, just some checks, checks and boxes and you, you've got an account. So, um, and certainly that can happen with any of the other platforms as well. So, um, so I, the, I think what, what might be happening may be a little bit different, I'm not sure. So what do you, what do you think? Yeah, well, you know, in my, <clears throat> I guess my family life, I have four kids and uh, three of them a little bit older, 12 and 13 and 13, and then one that's age six, a little bit younger. And uh, it's interesting because, you know, the younger ones, they, they kind of watch what the older ones are doing, right? And then mm -hmm. the older ones are really influenced by their peers much more than any psychiatrist who happen to live in the household, right? So I would say that uh, the requests for phones, particularly uh, for my daughter, <laughs> have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, progressed uh, ever since probably age 10. Uh, but we actually held out a little bit longer, even right now at age 13, we've gone a little bit intermittent, sort of as needed. So so I think there's been some, uh, you know, we, we've tried to put it off a little bit, just knowing that can be such a, you know, <clears throat> such a almost an addictive type behavior if there's no, no uh, limits on it, right? Uh, even though I know you and I are both proponents for using social media professionally, uh, of course, but we're both adults as well. So, uh, so I guess there's some variance there. Well, sure. I mean, I think there's a difference between adults and children. Children really have a hard time, I think, setting their own limits. Um, I think if you hand them something that uh, is very easy to, you know, quote unquote, get addicted to, they will, right? So if you give them like free access to watching videos or to, you know, getting into these sort of potentially communications or, commu you know, communities with other people, they, uh, they will take it as far as you let them. So it's really our place to put, put limits on, on this, both with age, but also with how much time they're spending each day. Um, that being said, I think, uh, again, recommendations, like, for example, I have a four-year-old and I tried very hard to follow screen time recommendations um, starting from birth, right, from the American Academy of Pediatrics. It was like, first of all, nothing for the first year or second year. And then after that, 30 minutes to an hour or less. But really, you know, after the pandemic started, I think all of that went out the window. I mean, it really did, you know, working from home and dealing with childcare issues, uh, it's, it's an easy way to essentially, you know, have some un, kind of like 
passive supervision of, of your child um, and your child's happy for a little bit, um, but there's potentially negative consequences to that. So we have to really be careful with how much time we're giving them. Yeah, I think the time piece, and I'll say in my clinical practice, as well as a child psychiatrist, it comes up uh, maybe even more so with kids that have some impulse control disorders like ADHD, you know, where they're, um, you know, tend to be a little bit more impulsive at times. And sometimes the, the uh, trying to set those limits can touch off World War III in the household, and it can be a repeated argument uh, where, uh, you know, a kid wants to play longer past the contracted time. And uh, parents are saying, you know, it's time for dinner, or you haven't done your homework, or your grades are sliding, whatever it might be. And so there's this constant negotiation, right? And um, I think it's probably a little bit different for each household. I don't know if you have any thoughts for the parents or, you know, just yeah. from your own perspective. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I think it's, it's easier said than done, but certainly we have to try not to put blame on the kids when we're talking to them about setting these limits. Um, and then also involve them in the discussion about why this is so important. Um, and so that way they don't feel like they're kind of being put upon. And I, you know, to some degree, like younger children need more supervision and older children are going to have a little bit more autonomy. So I, you know, I think um, treating it a little bit differently is gonna happen as they get older. Um, and then finally, I, I think we have to be setting the same restrictions on ourselves that we're setting on our kids, right? So we have to role model some of the things that we're doing. We can't tell our kids that we're not going to do any video games in the house when we're playing video games, right? So things like that. So um, absolutely, like all of those things, it's a little bit hard, but uh, those are the things I think that'll make it easier so that they're not turning into fights all the time. Cause that's certainly, I've seen that happen and I, you know, it's very easy for that to happen. It, it, it's well taken. And I think the role modeling is important too, even how often we're checking our own devices, mm -hmm. which is a constant uh, temptation, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, whether we're on them at dinner time, whether we're watching TV or, you know, uh, checking our, our scrolling through our, our email or, or checking Twitter, whatever it might be, Facebook, uh, so it does seem like there is some role for role modeling uh, there as well. Um, you know, we spend, you and I, <laughs> a fair amount of time, uh, I wouldn't say convincing our colleagues, but maybe speaking to our colleagues in psychiatry just about the positive piece of social media too. And there's some real benefits, right, potentially from mm -hmm. social media as well. And I, I don't want to overstate the risk of it. Uh, for example, uh, you know, there's uh, often people find connections to others who might share uh, some of the same struggles, uh, same identities, right? Uh, whether they are struggling with a mental illness and, you know, they want to find other people who might have struggled with a mood disorder or with autism or some other area, or uh, they just really have a deep passion for something and really connecting there as well. Do you want to just talk a little bit about maybe some of the benefits that, uh, you know, with judicious use uh, that social media can bring as well? I mean, I think certainly social media and particularly for adolescents um, who are having a hard time maybe in their own communities or getting bullied or things like that, um, sometimes can find communities like with certain, like I know with the, some of the video games where you're interacting with other players, sometimes you can find supportive groups of friends online, you know, which is I, I think a potentially a very positive thing if the friends are, you know, a good influence and things like that. Um, but that requires some levels of discussion from the parents and they have to kind of know what's going on in their kids' lives um, to, to, to know what's happening so that that doesn't get out of hand because who knows kind of sometimes who's on the other end of those. Um, so yeah, so that can be a positive benefit. Um, I, you know, um, I, I think people also worry about sometimes the negative effects of um, social media on, on kids and adolescents. And I think that that's a valid concern as well. Have, you know, have you seen any, anything like that in your practice? Um, I mean, I, I've seen a little bit of that, but um, you know, I think uh, certainly something worth talking about. Well, you know, I think I've seen bullying in different ways. <clears throat> and, and that I think leaves a lasting scar sometimes. And then sometimes I see things that might feed uh, behavior that might not be the best coping skills. So whether it's self injurious behavior and you're sharing that online or uh, eating disorders, I think there's been a lot of struggles with eating disorders during this pandemic because it doesn't seem like it responds as well to telehealth unlike many other 
mental health disorders. <clears throat> but you know, I do think uh, there are some risks out there, and of course, uh, being exploited, as you mentioned, by others always mm -hmm. is a risk as well. Yeah, I think that that's probably like one of those things that people worry about the most is probably that's um, sensationalized in the media sometimes, um, and it's probably, you know, I would say potentially one of the lesser likely issues versus maybe, um, you know, excess number of hours of social media interfering with your kid's sleep, you know, that's potentially a negative issue. If your kid is spending six hours of, of screen time per day, that can affect their sleep overnight, which can affect their mood or um, potentially like some anxiety symptoms, things like that. Those are more common things I think that would potentially be affected. And those are the things I would look for um, uh, if your kids are spending a lot of time on social media. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Having devices out of the room for uninterrupted sleep because texting can sometimes go deep into the night, right? And so mm -hmm. you want to make sure they're not on messaging apps. And then as you're saying, you know, with bullying, I found too that unless you ask, you don't know. So, and kids might keep it to themselves. So do have that time to check in. For us, it's family dinners. For other people, it might be other venues, breakfast, whatever. But that's so valuable just to ask and talk about things and also just check up on misinformation which sometimes also goes around on social media as well. Anything else you want to add as a closing remark, uh, Christina, as you're thinking about advising parents and families? Yeah, I mean, I think when we're thinking about, you know, what we can replace social media time with, it's honestly, it's just positive family experiences. And so we just have to think like what works for our family. So is it, um, like you said, like a family dinner, maybe that's something you don't do as much. Um, is it, you know, going to the park or taking a walk every day? That's 30 minutes that, you know, that nobody's on their phone. Um, things like that, that uh, they don't seem like, like big things, but those are the things that kind of make your family your family and also will keep your kids off social media. So that's, that's kind of my, I guess, last, uh, last piece of advice. Well, I appreciate all the pearls, Christina. It's great to have this conversation with you. Yeah, thank you so much, Howard, and uh, always nice chatting with you as well. Well, if you want to learn more from experts like Dr. Gerges, uh, please like, comment, and subscribe to APA's YouTube channel. You can visit www.psychiatry.org for more mental health information and resources. Thank you so much, and have a great day.